Okay, this lecture will cover chapter one, and in this lecture I'll be talking about assessing error and establishing credibility for decisions and statistics. So let's start off by talking about uh, a situation that we can use to create a hypothesis. So suppose that there is a bag. Suppose we have a bag. And this bag is full of this bag's full of money. And the bag could be bag A or bag B. So the bags, all the bag is going to have is like a dollar sign on it and it's going to have money in it. And we know it could be, there's two possibilities, two options. The bag could be bag A or could be bag B. And I might even go so far as to say bag A, bag, I can give you a little more information maybe here and say bag B has more money Bag A has less money. And from this, we could create a statistical hypothesis. In other words, since there's two possibilities for this, this bag, the, the, the bag could be, whoops, that's supposed to be a W, shown, the shown bag could be bag A, or the shown bag could be bag B. So these are our two possibilities, and notice this forms a dichotomy. These two things cannot both be true. The bag is either bag A or the bag is bag B. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, so suppose furthermore that uh, we're going to try to make a decision we're going to make a decision about which bag it is we're going to we wish to decide whether H naught is true or whether H naught is false. Now, one of the reasons I can focus on whether or not H naught is true or false is because if, it, if, if, if we decide that H naught is false, it means since this is a dichotomy, it means H1 must then be true. Now, we're going to decide, um, basically, we're going to try to decide which bag we are looking at based on, one, based on drawing a single bill. So the bag's full of money. It's, we know it has money in it. And we're going to make our decision um, by drawing out one bill. And I'm going to say randomly select. We're going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say we're, we'll, we will be allowed to ran, randomly select one bill. Okay, so suppose we do that. And suppose that that bill, and again, I, I think I'm going to go ahead and define a variable now, because x is going to equal the value of a randomly selected bill. The 
the realm. So X is the value of a randomly selected bill from the shown bag. So remember, the bag that we're looking at just has a dollar sign on it. Could be bag A, could be bag B. We're going to assume it's bag A. That's our null. And then we're going to draw a bill out, a single bill out of this bag and try to decide whether or not we should we should uh, stick with the null or whether or not we should reject the null in favor of the alternate. So suppose we reach into the bag and we say, uh, and we pull out a $10 bill. What's our decision going to be? What is this going to imply we should do? Well, we might say this isn't a very large bill, so we should reject the null hypothesis. Okay. Now, there's really kind of a problem here. It's sort of a, uh, in terms of the statistics, because basically what I've done is I've sort of made a decision that I can't really assess in any meaningful way the likelihood that I mis made a mistake. In other words, when we make decisions in statistics, we have to acknowledge that that decision could have been made in error. And it's really important in statistics that we're able to assess the likelihood that we've made a, a, a mistake in our decision, in, in making the decision. So in other words, how likely is it that we, that we made a mistake here and that we made an error? Because again, it's quite possible that bag B has $10 vouchers in it as well, or I'm sorry, $10 bills in it as well. And so, so it could be that the, the, the bill I pulled out was actually from bag B. So the only thing I'm basing my decision on here is that um, bag B has more money in it than bag A does. Now, when I go, now, Let's look at the next pot, or, or let's look at the, uh, let, let me give you more information about bag A and bag B. In other words, if I now tell, if I'm now told what's actually in bag A and what's actually in bag B, notice that there are four vouchers in, that four $10 bills, I should say, in bag A. And there are only three in bag B. So, so maybe my decision to reject that hypothesis was, was not such a good decision after all. Now, I, I, again, I, I want to start building up to the concepts in the class um, in, in chapter one. And one of the ideas here now is that um, um, before I actually pull a bill out of the bag and before I actually gather any data, what I really should do is create a framework for the decision. Okay? And the way we do that is we, we create something called a decision rule. And this decision rule is going to be based on what's unlikely from the null hypothesis, while at the same time is very likely under the alternate. So in other words, bag A only has a single $100 bill, while bag B has six hundred dollar bills. Therefore, if we were to reach into the bag and pull out a one hundred dollar bill, it's far more likely that that bill would have come from bag B rather than from bag A. Therefore, what we're going to do is perhaps create a decision rule that says we should reject H naught if X is equal to $100. In other words, if we 
reach into this un, this 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 uh, bag that we have. This has got a dollar sign on it, remember? So it's not marked. I don't know if I have bag A. I don't know if I have bag B. I'm going to make a decision based on the single bill I pull out. And now what I've created is a rule that's going to dictate what the decision is. Under this scenario, I can now think about what a what different errors I might make and what the likelihood of those errors are. In other words, if I were to reach in and pull out this $100 bag, I would reject the null hypothesis. So I would be saying, rather than A, rather than bag A, I have bag B. I'm rejecting the null in favor of the alternate. And based on this decision rule, okay, we might ask the question, what is the probability that this particular rule that we've created will result in a wrong decision. What is the chance or probability that this rule will result in a wrong decision? Well, in this example, it's pretty straightforward because, again, remember, when I apply the rule, the rule says if we pull out this $100 voucher, we're going to reject the null. In other words, we're going to say we don't have bag A, we actually have bag B. There's one voucher in bag A that would trigger that erroneous decision. Therefore, the chance of making this type of error, the probability is one out of the total number of bills in the bag. And so there's 11, 15, 21 uh, bills in the bag. So we would say the probability is one out of 21. And in fact, this type of error that I'm talking about right now is what we call a type 1 error in statistics. And there are actually two types of errors that could be made, type 1 error and type 2 error. So the type 1 error, which is alpha, that's the notation we use, in this example is equal to 1 out of 21. All right, and type 1 error happens when we reject H0 and H0 turns out to be true or is true. Now, we don't generally have any way of knowing whether or not H0 is true for sure, but since we know the distribution of bills in the bag, we can speculate on the likelihood that we would make a type 1 error. Well, certainly, the deciding, you know, pulling out a $100 bill isn't the only possibility, right? We could also pull out any of the other bills in the bag. And if we pulled any bill out of the bag other than the $100 bill, then we would be also, well, our decision rule would be to not reject the null, okay? And that is actually what we call a type 2 error. So a type 2 error occurs when you fail to reject the null and it's actually not true. Now, let's think about this for a second, okay? So if we get a, any of the other, if we pull out any of these other bills, a, a 1, 5, 10, 20, or $50 bill, the decision is going to be not to reject the null. And that means we have, we think we have bag A, but in fact we have bag B. Now, all of the vouchers 
all the one dollar any I'm sorry any of the bills any of the one five ten twenty or fifty dollar bills in bag B could trigger a type two error. Therefore, the chance of a type two error would be nine twelve. 14, 15 out of 21, which is equal to 5 sevenths. So the chance of a type 2 error here would be 5 sevenths. And again, parenthetically here, I'll make a notation of when type 2 error happens. Type 2 error happens when we fail to reject H naught and H naught is false. Now one thing I want to point out here is that we actually aren't going to in general know whether or not we've made a type 1 error and we're not in general going to know whether or not we make a type 2 error. And I think what I, I like to describe alpha and beta and type 1 and type 2, the chance of type 2, 1 or 2 error as an error rate. And this ties into what we call the frequentist interpretation of probability. And what that means is if we repeated this process of decision making over and over and over again, and made you know many many decisions in this fashion. Alpha is the proportion of decisions that result in a type one error, and beta is the proportion of decisions that result in a type two error. And really we can think of that as a rate. How frequently, as you repeat these things over and over again, do you make these types of errors? It's also known as the relative frequency interpretation of probability. And again, we'll, we're, I'm going to talk about this throughout the semester. Many of the, many of the videos I create, will, 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 um, I'll be discussing this concept of the frequentist interpretation and relative frequency uh, probabilities as relative frequencies. So this isn't the first time we'll discuss this um, concept. All right. Um, now another way we can look at those same um, distributions is in terms of a graph. And th these graphs are what we call frequency plots. So I'll just write that down. These are called frequency plots. So notice that the table we had before had six bag A had six one dollar bills, five five dollar bills, four ten dollar bills, and so on. So this graph displays a there's another way of looking at the distribution for bag A, and then the graph below is another way of looking at the distribution for bag B. Now I want to look at this. I want to look at the same distribution or the same uh, problem uh, with a different decision rule. So, and one of the reasons for doing this is because our rules and definitions that we use in statistics have to apply for both discrete finite distributions, such as this, where there are only, a, in this case, say, a handful of possibilities for the variable. They also have to. Uh, they also have to fit what we call continuous distributions, which are based on a variable that has an uncountable or an uh, uncountably infinite number of possibilities. So, let me look at a different decision rule. So suppose our decision rule is to reject H naught if the value of the voucher 
is at least 50. In other words, now I'm going to think about it in terms of like drawing a line through the distribution and we're going to say reject H naught on this side if we get a 50 or $100 bill and do not reject Oops, do not reject H naught if we get a, a vouch or a bill that's one, five, ten, or twenty dollar in dollars in value. So now again we can think about both type one and type two errors. And I'm gonna do this also a different way. I'm gonna I'm gonna describe this in a different different way. So now to now I'm gonna say to calculate. alpha we need three things okay now I'm building up to the definition uh, in the book first thing we need null distribution We have that. That's that's bag A's distribution because we're sh assuming the shown bag is bag A, and so the null distribution would be bag A's distribution. Second thing we, we always need to calculate alpha is a decision rule, and we have that because I wrote one down right here. Now the third thing we need is something called the direction of extreme and this is something I haven't talked about yet but direction of extreme is a term in our is a is a term in our book um, and the definition of direction of extreme is the direction in which the variable the values of the variable become more likely to occur under the alternate than under the null so and it's a hard concept to get, but here the direction of extreme is to the right because 50 and $100 vouchers are common in bag B, while at the same time they're very unusual for bag A. So the direction of, a here, of extreme would be one-sided to the right in this example. And as you read the textbook, this direction of extreme concept um, is how we think about what is as extreme or more extreme. So when you when you read these definitions, like the the the, the definition of alpha is the chance of of, um, of getting um, of having a um, a voucher val or I'm sorry a bill drawn out that's at least as extreme as 50. So so that would be, again, 50 or 100. So the way we could think about that, again, the value of alpha is to look at the number of, of uh, or the frequency of the variable in the, what we could call a rejection region. Sometimes we refer to this as a rejection region. And so now alpha, again, we would calculate to be 3 out of 21 or 1 seventh. Now beta... Okay, to calculate beta, I switch down to the alternate distribution, and I think about how we would make a type 2 error. Well, again, these are the values of the bills that would cause a type 2 error. So beta now is 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 out of 21. So that would be beta or the type 2 error rate. And I already, did, I, I don't need this slide, so I, I already talked about the errors. Now let's talk about data, okay? Now suppose we're using the same decision rule that resulted in the alpha we had before. The alpha, and again, the decision rule was to reject if the voucher value was at least 50. That was our rule. So that resulted in an alpha of 3 out of 21, which is equal to 1 7th. Now suppose we reach into the bag, 
and and pull out a bill and say that bill has is is a hundred dollar bill okay now we can talk about something we refer to as the p-value and the p-value tells us how extreme the data the actual data is so there, there's a couple of things going on one thing here is our decision rule that we agree to before we collect the data and that decision rule is what's used to calculate our type 1 error rate and our type 2 error rates. Then we have the actual data that we collect. And in this case, the data consists of a particular bill we reach in and pull out. And this time, we're going to say it's a $100 bill. So the p-value tells us how rare and unusual the data is. So all of this stuff links together like this. We assume the null is true. We collect our data, and we calculate how rare and unusual that data is under the assumption the null is true. The more rare and unusual the data, the stronger the evidence against the null in favor of the alternate. So in this example, since bag A only has $100 bill, the chance of getting a bill at, at least as extreme as $100 would be 1 out of 21. So another way, so notice another way that we could make the decision here would be by comparing the p-value to alpha. So in a sense, alpha tells us how rare and unusual the data needs to be the p-value tells us how rare and unusual the data is. So if, so if the p-value is less than or at least as small as alpha, then our decision should be to reject H0. And of course, in this case, 1 over 21, our p-value is less than 1 over 7. So we would or should reject H0. So our decision here would be to reject the null hypothesis. Now, I also want to talk about a, po a, a twist in the problems. And, the, you know, the, the, the authors don't really get into this too much in Chapter 1, but I wanted to point out that in practice, and in, in, when we do statistics in practice, it's actually unusual to have both the null distribution and the alternate distribution. It's more common is just to have the null, dis the null distribution based on assumption because we're assuming the null is true and the alternate is not nailed down. It's, it's, it's not usually known. Now we could still, if we go back to what I said at the very beginning, which is bag B has more money in it than bag A, okay, if we had at least had that much information, then we could still calculate alpha and we could still calculate the p-value. In other words, even if I don't necessarily have the alternate distribution explicitly, I still could say the direction of extreme is to, right, to the right because I know I'm told that, or I'm, I'm, I'm theorizing perhaps, that bag B has more money. Now, I know, I mean, it, and this is, again, this is part of the problems that we run into when we do statistics, because some people might argue, well, it could have more money because it just has more, like, you know, it has, like, you know, 50 $10 bills and, you know, 30 $20 bills or something, or there's more bills overall. But if we assume that there are the same number of bills, say, and we're told that bag B has more money in it, then it would be plausible to assume that the direction of extreme here is to the right. Because certainly for bag A, large value bills are unusual. And if there are the same number of bills in the bag and bag B has more money, then it would be safe to, to assume perhaps that there are more larger value bills in bag B. But the point I want to make is if we make that assumption, notice I can still create my rejection zones based on the null or my rejection re regions and I can assess type 1 error so I can still calculate alpha
And if again, if I happen to pick the hundred dollar, if if we reach in the bag and pull out a hundred dollar bill, then we can still calculate the p value. But the problem here is, I don't have any way to calculate beta. And this is the very typical in the real world when we do statistics. We know the null distribution explicitly. We can calculate alpha. We can calculate p values as long as we can determine direction of extreme. But beta, don't know what it is. That's very common. Um, now, one of the things I like to emphasize with my students is that when you're looking at journal articles and you're looking at statistical research, you should be focused on whether or not the null hypothesis is rejected. And if you read chapter one of our textbook carefully, you'll come to the conclusion that that data is significant if H naught is rejected. In other words, we say if we're able to reject the null hypothesis, then we say the data is significant or we have or the result is significant perhaps. If the null hypothesis is not rejected, it means the data is not significant. And if you're reading a journal article where failure to reject the null is given any kind of credence, then what you should be looking for is beta or power. And, and our textbook gets into this. I don't spend a whole lot of time on power, but but the definition of power is 1 minus beta. And now, this is based on what's called the complement rule in probability theory. But the basic idea here is that if you have a really high type 2 error rate, in other words, if beta is a, a high probability, then the power will be low. Because again, 1 is the largest probability we can have. 1 means the uh, event will happen with certainty. And so large type 2 error rates mean we have low power test. And the concept here is if you have a low power test and you fail to detect which, if you fail to reject the null using a low power test, then you really shouldn't have had an expectation necessarily of rejecting the null in the first place. So, so failure to reject isn't necessarily evidence that the null hypothesis is true. And again, I know this is all confusing. We're going to talk about this more through, I have another video I'm going to make this week and um, as soon as I can and I'll get it up on my webpage and this will make hopefully more sense to you. Anyhow, that's the end of uh, this, this first lecture on chapter one.